Go for it. Hey, how's it going? I'm a huge fan of yours, um, and I, what I really wanted to say was I find it really hard to have a civil discussion with people from the opposite side, because I want to learn more about their point of view, and sometimes they want to learn more about my point of view. What do you think the best way about going about kind of, you know, having the groundwork, like, all right, you know, let's present each other's side and actually discuss it and not let's devolve into a screaming match. I mean, uh, the first thing you have to do is you actually have to do a little bit of assessment as to whether the person you're talking to wants to have a conversation with you. Right? There are only a few reasons to have a conversation with somebody on the left. One is to actually have a discussion. You might find somebody on the left who actually wants to exchange ideas. Kind of rare, but it happens. Uh, you could also have a situation where you just want to hone your own ideas. So you're arguing for your own purposes or you're debating somebody on a stage, in which case your goal is basically to humiliate that person as badly as possible. But you have to decide which conversation is which, and also you, you know this. I mean, everybody knows this, but they don't apply it. They get in a Facebook fight, and then five posts in, and an hour later, they're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Think with the first post. Is this the thing that's going to help me, or is this the thing that's just a waste of time? And I don't know if, it's, if I can ask after. We'll take a picture with you after the conversation. I'll try to stick around as long as I can, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey Ben, um, I'm 14 years old. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm from Rochester, and uh, I'm a conservative. And the New York public school like education system makes it really hard for me to spread my like conservative viewpoints, like my friends, my community. And uh, as you can see, my shirt uh, says Ben Shapiro 20. And uh, I was just wondering if at any point in the future could we possibly see you running for office of any kind. Um, so a few years ago, I probably would have said yes, because it was something I was interested in. Watching as public figures get absolutely destroyed personally, it makes me less likely to do it. I think our politics is, is such right now that decent people, and I, I try to consider myself decent, uh, decent people are sort of being driven out of the public square. People who have no shame or honor, I think, are, are being encouraged to, to run for office on every side of the aisle. Um, you know, I could see a possibility sometime in the future. Uh, it won't be in 2020, uh, but, it, but I appreciate the sentiment. All right, thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, I'm a freshman at UB um, from uh, Dutchess County. Uh, you talked about divorce rates and how divorce rates have been increasing this country, country since the 1970s and just kind of alluded to that as evidence of the failure of, ra of radical Well, they sort of leveled off since like the, the 2000s, like the early 2000s. But yes, they're still higher than they were in the 50s and 40s. Right. Couldn't that also simply be because of the fact that women are now more socioeconomically able to be independent than men? Like, how can you say that radical feminism caused divorces and also ignore the fact that possibly it was just that women became able to be independent, therefore they started to divorce more? Because they would be becoming economic in, in, economically independent in the same period as they were getting divorced, as they were getting married. Meaning that these aren't 20-year marriages that are breaking up, these are like five-year marriages that are breaking up, which suggests to me a mental shift that's taken place in the nature of how we think about marriage rather than socioeconomic status being the indicator. But Meaning like, that I suppose that economics could tie into this, except for the fact that people who are higher income tend to stay married more often than people who are lower income. Right, so that, that sort of undercuts the argument a little bit. Meaning that if, if, you're, if you're richer, you tend to be married longer on average. People who are poorer tend to get divorced more Where did more you often. get that uh, statistical the Census Bureau. <laughs> Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of the show. I got the mug. I'm a subscriber. Oh, awesome. Um, it's been overflowing this week, the Leftist I, Tears, Hatter, Cold Tumblr. I never have to fill it up. Um, the question I wanted to ask is, after the whole, I guess there's no better way to put it, but debacle involving the, the appointment of Justice Kavanaugh to, mm -hmm. the, to the bench, do you think this is a moment where Americans as, like, uh, as a society are going to start to maybe come back together and, and, and try to establish... <laughs> norms, or, or is this just a moment where our politics are just going to further polarize and we're just going to start to tear apart even harder at the seams? Number one, I love your optimism. Um, I'm, I'm by nature a pessimist, which means I'm always right eventually. Uh, so it's, <laughs> so my feeling is that when you see people who are screaming and trying to pry open 13 ton, ton bronze doors in front of the Supreme Court <laughs> as Brett Kavanaugh is being sworn in inside, and then you have full editorials in the New York Times saying that white women are racist because they supported Brett Kavanaugh, which I just don't even understand. 
Um, I, no, I don't think this, this rift is going to be healed anytime soon. In fact, I think that I, I, the book that, I'm write, that I have coming out next year is largely about why this giant rift has opened up in America in a time when we are historically wealthy, when we really don't have any major foreign crises on our hands. We don't have a lot in common anymore is the sad truth. I mean, a nation is defined by a common history, a common culture, a common set of goals, common institutions. All of those things are being torn asunder by serious divides that we have about how we view our own central principles. And we used to be unified by a belief in God-given rights and limited government. Obviously, that doesn't unify us. We used to be unified by a belief in Judeo-Christian virtue. That no longer unifies us. We used to be unified by a belief that America was essentially a good place, even though we'd never lived up to our, our full promise. Even that, I think, is no longer a unifying principle, which is why we now have people who see American history as in Howard Zinn fashion. It's just a long history of suffering and pain and patriarchal institution, institutional discrimination. Um, uh, if those bridges don't, if those gaps don't get bridged, I think that we're headed toward a schism that, that is going to grow larger and larger over time. I, I don't see how, the only thing I could see is that eventually just disgust with the way this works means that, forget politics, somebody who's felt to be fundamentally decent ends up running for office and you get a spate of those people running for office and then it's about voting for the decency of the people as opposed to a particular political agenda. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, Ben. How are you doing tonight? Doing okay. How are you? All right. uh, so I'm a liberal, and well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, but at the same time, <laughs> on the the topic of free speech, I consider myself a libertarian. That's why so, you're a liberal and not a leftist. You see, whenever whenever I do my speeches, right, it's always liberal versus leftist. Liberals are people who disagree with me on politics, but aren't trying to attack me with machetes. And leftists are, are people who disagree with me on politics and are trying to shut down my speeches. All right, so what I wanted to ask you about, so me personally, I disagree with uh, many social networks move to ban Alex Jones from their platforms, and I think it's a violation of the spirit of the First Amendment. But in comparison with that, I was asking, would you agree with me that by the NFL stopping Kaepernick from kneeling, is that also a violation of the First Amendment, the spirit of it in some sense, and do you believe that a corporation has the right to do what it wants knowing about that First So there, there are several speech? actual questions. Number one, do corporations have the right to do what they want? Yes, Facebook and the NFL have the right to do what they want, right? They're private corporations, they do. Now, the, the more important question is the first one you asked about sort of the spirit of the First Amendment. Uh, I think that the, the, the real question is what these corporations are designed to do. So social networks were originally designed to facilitate discourse between various political sides. That's what they were designed to do. The NFL was not really designed to do that. The NFL presents a product, right? The NFL's product is what is on the field. If the NFL were to find people for stuff that they said on Twitter, then I would suggest that the NFL was, was doing something wrong. For the NFL to say, you're affecting our viewership and the product that we present, that's a different thing. Just as if Alex Jones worked for CNN and he, and he went on the air and he started talking about Satan, get behind me. Ah, I'm unbuttoning my shirt now. Look at this. Underneath, I got another shirt. Right, if he started doing that routine <laughs> on CNN. If he started doing that routine on CNN, I think at that point, CNN has every right to do whatever they want with him. So the, for the corporate question, the question is, what is the corporation designed to do? And, and the, the lie of Facebook and Twitter was that they were basically going to be essentially free open networks for discourse, and then it turns out that they're more publishers, they're more like my site or CNN, right, trying to add editorial guidance. What I think is that Facebook and Twitter, if they want to ban people, they should do so based on threats of violence, sl you know, actual legal slander, like they, that, that's where they should draw the line, not add stuff we don't like, because Alex Jones is a, is a nutball. So uh, can, I, can I have a quick follow-up, if you don't mind? Just uh, Sure. Uh, so then, would you disagree with perhaps Tim Tebow's right to kneel in prayer on the field? Yeah, if they'd find him for, his, for kneeling in prayer on the field, then they, they would have every right to do that, too. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, Ben. I want to start off and say I'm a huge fan of yours and would love the possibility to get a picture with you. And that, <laughs> and that I'm truly hoping you run for presidency in 2024, although if you wanted to secure my, vo my vote during your campaign, then by some absolute miracle, I'd have to see you defeat Ocasio-Cortez in the debate. 
<laughs> but I don't know. Stop cat calling her, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but that brings me to my question. With college campuses becoming increasingly overwhelmed by professors with leftist teachings and rhetoric, I, like many other young conservatives, feel my back against the wall and not wanting to share my conservative views, especially on sensitive su subjects, for running the risk of uh, being ostracized by a mob of my classmates. What sort of advice would you give to this? So my advice has always been to be practical, meaning that you have to decide what the risk-benefit analysis looks like exactly, mm -hmm. uh, the cost-benefit analysis. So when I was in law school, there were certain professors who were really great about debate. And you know, people on the left who really enjoyed the fact that we go back and forth. And that was wonderful. I enjoyed it. And then there were certain professors who weren't. And those were the professors where I'd basically keep quiet because my grade was more important to me than making a point everyone was going to forget 20 seconds later. If I wanted to talk to students outside of class, I would do it then. Uh, that's always been my view. I've never felt like you need to sacrifice your grade or sacrifice your future to make a point in class that everyone is going to forget 15 seconds later, except for the professor who's going to grade you down. The best path is to speak truth whenever possible, and when not possible, don't, get good grades, make lots of money, threaten to withhold alumni funding, uh, and then, <laughs> because discrimination in the classroom obviously shouldn't be approved by the administration. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Um, hey, Ben, I'm a big fan. I met you during the meet and greet um, <laughs> when you came here earlier. And you touched on the issue of abortion, and I'd just ask, like to ask a question, because I did a debate on abortion in high school, even though I don't necessarily agree with that. I was on the pro side, and I actually uh -huh. took it as an opportunity to learn from the other side. And although I can say the, one of their main talking points was how if abortion was made illegal, then people would just get illegal abortions, and then twice the amount of people would die in the instance of that. But then I also said, well, that's not my issue. My issue is with how it's almost weaponized, like to say like, like the left kind of weaponized it where it's like if you don't agree with abortion, like abortion is this amazing thing, an amazing right, an amazing power, but then I'm like it's actually a really tough decision. It's not something I'm going to go celebrate and say I'm really, like it's awesome, it's a beautiful thing. And like, why, how do you think the left did that? Like, how do you think Well, I think, I think the left actually came to a, a logical realization, which is that safe, legal, and rare is an untenable political position. So that was the Clintonian position in the 90s. They said abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Well, when you say that it should be rare, you're undercutting safe and legal, actually, or at least legal, right? Because the problem is, if you say it's rare, you're acknowledging that there is moral content to the action you are taking, which raises the question as to why it should be legal, right? So in other words, if it's what the left says, and it's just removal of a polyp, why should it be rare? I don't think polyp removal should be rare. I don't think anyone else believes that either. But when the left acknowledges there's a moral content to what it is that they're doing, they get themselves into a rhetorical trap. So instead, it turns into shout your abortion, be proud of your abortion. I'd be proud that it was, like a, it, was, it was like a step into womanhood to get an abortion. And anybody, I think, with any moral sense can see how terrible that is. Um, but the left has made, you know, people who are left on abortion have made a crusade and a sacrament out of abortion in a way that they hadn't even when I was, you know, in, in high school. So it's, it's pretty incredible and pretty, pretty horrifying. And that's why I've always thought, I mean, on Fox, I did my, my election special on Sunday. And on Fox, I did a monologue at the very end of the show about abortion. Yeah, I remember that. And, and, the, and the monologue on abortion, I think the best way to fight against the pro-choice position, the pro-abortion position, uh, is to actually just show pictures of what it is that this baby is. Okay, because there's not a single Democrat in the, in the Senate or in the House of Representatives that I know of who would vote to save a baby at the, at the 12th week or 14th week. Mm -hmm. That's nuts. <laughs> That's nuts. You can feel the baby kicking. I know, I've had two of them. You know, this, is, this, is, this is crazy tale, uh, crazy talk, and the facts and the science happen to be on our side. One of my pet peeves on this issue is when people say, oh, you only say that because you're religious. You only say that because of the Bible. I have never invoked the Bible or God in any argument about abortion. Yeah, I get that a lot, too. It, it's, it's idiotic. Like... It's idiotic. It, it's, just, it's a way for them to avoid the necessary scientific conclusion from the fact that human life begins in fertilization. They don't want to talk science, so they accuse you of being a religious bigot, even though you're actually not invoking God. I do hate that when they just say it's a clump of cells. It's just... That's just what I say is you are technically a clump of cells as well. Just a walking book. Because like, they are. You're, just, you're, you're a slightly more developed clump of cells, but that doesn't mean that you're, that, like, none, none of the other arguments hold. The viability argument doesn't hold. There are plenty of human beings who are not viable outside of outside support from machines or a pacemaker. We don't, we don't suggest that they can now be terminated. There are lots of people who don't have proper brain function. And babies, 
in, or, in, or fetuses or embryos, which are going to develop proper brain function, to suggest that those babies are, are somehow lesser because of improper brain function for a temporary period, not even for a permanent period, uh, that, that is obviously uh, uh, casting aspersions at people who don't necessarily have full brain function. It's very difficult to make an intellectually consistent case for why abortion uh, ought to be treated as, as morally ambiguous. I, I have a tough time with it, frankly. Thank you, man. Uh, so I'm Robert. I'm one of the coastal liberals, as you'd say. Um, I've, been, I've been watching you for years now, and I've, uh, like, I read your book on the arguments to, to fight against people like me. Uh, and I feel bad, because like, for the most part, the people who have been arguing against you aren't nearly as elegant or eloquent as they should be. Um, but I, I'd just like to ask, so one of your points uh, you very strongly make is that um, it's unfair for you know, people like me to label you as like, a racist or a bigot, um, just as like, a smear tactic. But, have you ever acknowledged that like, maybe it's not a smear tactic, but it's based on things you've said? So like, for example, like, um, on the Israel-Palestine conflict, you, know, you called the Arabs, uh, yeah, you already know what I'm gonna say. Um, you know, you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, I didn't mean to presume. Yeah, so, like, you, you, so you say- I've written several full columns about it. Yeah, you, you I've said- I've talked about how people don't read the follow-up tweets. Uh, I wrote a I, column- I've read, I've read some of the tweets, and the tweets were just as bad. I mean, you say a lot of things that are just like racist, Right? But then if I call you a racist, then you defend it by saying, like, I, I didn't read enough, right? So, so what I was going to say before, so, so you see the so Arabs... Give me, okay, fine. So give me, give, me, uh, give me my racist tweets in context. Okay, well... Yeah, you can't prepare. I, so, I, right, I, go, go, I, do it. Um, so, you, so you said, um, the Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. This is not a difficult... Day. Well, you, oh, you before that said Israel's, Israelis did, like to build. Did you, did you, did you, did you, okay, now the follow-ups, because you said the follow-ups didn't make it any better. Uh, well, th there's separate things that you said. No, that no, no. I want follow-ups to that one, though. Follow-ups to that specific Would you like tweet? me to get them? I'll get them for you. If you have them, sure. Um, but in the meantime, do you mind if I, while you do that? What was that? Do you mind if I continue while you do that? Um, well, I'd like to take them one by one. So sure. If, if you, it, okay. why, don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we delay that one until the end while I look okay. this up from the um, podium in front of 600 people? Y you've also said... <laughs> okay. I'll wait. Uh, so on that particular issue, you've also said that the Arab-Palestine populace is, by and large, by and large con constitutes the most evil population on the face of the planet. Before, you said that you've never brought up religion when it comes to abortion, but I don't think that you've avoided religion when it comes to the Israeli conflict, and I don't know that you can be completely unbiased in the issue, given, given that, you know... You well, are... I can be unbiased on the subject that the Palestinians have elected three terrorist governments to form a unity government with the stated goal of yeah. the destruction of the state of Israel and the murder of all Jews in the area. So that I can be relatively unbiased on. As far but, as the idea that the Palestinian population... As far as okay. the idea that the Palestinian population is more evil than other populations, they certainly hold more evil views than other populations by poll statistics, by how many, by how many Palestinians approve of terror attacks, by how many Palestinians voted for an actual terror group, Hamas, and another actual terror group, the Palestinian Authority, and another actual terror group, the Islamic Jihad. Okay, so I don't think that all, all views are equal, and I don't think that people who hold evil views are necessarily good. I mean, I'm sorry if the polls don't support the idea that everyone is equally wonderful, but everyone is not equally wonderful. Okay, I'm looking up these statements now, yeah. so if um, you'd like to give me a second. But you, you've continued, you deny secular Zionism, and you... Quote, Prior, there are, okay, so here, sure. I've got them okay, you, me. Go okay so I'll finish that. that one, then we can move. Okay, ready? There are many, many Christian and Muslim Arabs who are wonderful people, just not the ones who oppose Israel and the Israel-Arab conflict. That would be okay. the response within the same Twitter thread. Okay, in the post re Israelis versus Arabs, I wrote about Arabs who take part in the Israeli-Arab conflict as anyone who can read knows. Hashtag dumbasses. <laughs> okay. Quote, I think it has much more to do with the fact that the Palestinian leadership supported by the Palestinian population uses millions for terror. I should have been more specific. Arabs who actively seek Israel's destruction. Those would be the follow-up tweets. Does yeah, that so, sound like a genocidal so mania to you, or does it sound like I'm specifically labeling a group of people who have called for Israel's destruction? I, I like to point out that you're not a racist, but they're dumbasses, and there's, you're allowed to insult them. Yes, also, because if someone calls me a racist is, without evidence, they are definitionally a dumbass. What, what is genocide? Wait. <laughs> What is genocide? Like the, uh, after, when the, so you said that you, you want to be like Churchill, right? And after the Allies, when they moved the German-speaking Polish out of Poland... So now right you're talking about a column I wrote when I was 19 years old that I, that I actually, that I morally abhorred and, and denounced yeah. myself, I think six years ago? Yeah, you, you and have repeatedly And have repeatedly said was a bad column that I wrote when I was 19 years old? 
Okay. Okay, so um, new, well, I, I, next. I, wish, I wish I had more time. Like, do you want to do you want to get a drink sometime? Like a non-alcoholic beverage? What was that say? One more time. Do you want to get a, like a non-alcoholic drink sometime? Because like, I have a lot here. <laughs> I really do. I have, like. I mean, I, I know that I know I'd that like you've got a book. You. For, uh, uh, I, let, let me just say this: for everything that you're going to say, yeah. I've addressed literally every one of those points. I have yeah. a column that I put out probably only a few months ago. And the literal yeah. title of it is, so here's a giant list of all the dumb stuff I've ever done. Don't worry, I'll I, keep updating it. I, I didn't get that one in my research. I, I, so I do I, apologize if I've misrepresented, like, I, I did, my research wasn't able to be so thorough, because it was a pretty uh, last minute decision to start, like, really going in and trying to ask you a question. And again, that's, that, that's totally fine, and I appreciate you coming, and yeah. I appreciate you asking me the questions, but if the notion is that I'm a racist before you actually read all well, of my responses not, to that. Not, I mean, the racist is just one part. I also like the transgender, like you don't believe in transgenders, and like, that's not really supported well, I, mean, I don't know what that means. I don't believe in transgenders. I mean, well, you, you, I, a transgender you, people exist. It's not something to believe in or not. You've said, <laughs> yeah. You've said that gender and sex are the same thing. You, they think they're I've synonymous. said that gender and sex are linked. I've said that femininity and masculinity just are before, linked to male and before, female. Just before you said that they're... Right, there are two genders. I don't believe yeah. there are 1,000 genders. And if I think that if you're defining gender as just a random series of societal constructs, then there aren't two genders, there are infinite numbers of genders. Because everybody is a mix of feminine and masculine. So why restrict it to 70 genders? Make it 6 billion genders, since we all have our unique mix of what male and female constitute. And, I don't, and, and, I, and yes, I don't think that there can be such a thing as a male in a female's body. I don't think that there is a female and a male's body, and I find the logic to support that and the science to support that utterly lacking. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I uh, didn't... Really I, I'd, I'd be happy to get a non-alcoholic yeah, beverage with you and discuss yeah, it more fully. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you for coming. Th thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John, and uh, I am a senior uh, doing a, a political science major. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask the question uh, in regards to uh, uh, this. <laughs> Sorry, it's my first time ever doing no worries, this don't sort go of thing. It's uh, fine. OK. Uh, you stated that you didn't care about people's concern about the browning of America, which, in my opinion, is essentially not caring about the issue of illegal immigration. No, that's and, not right. And, well, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and, and, and yet, you support Israel's ethnostate by stating that Judaism must be preserved since elements like this uh, uphold Jewish national identity and culture, which I don't mind. But the fact that you, know, you don't care about the demographic change in America is kind of concerning because you know, we're all Americans here, right? Okay. And you know, I, the question is, do you want our nation to end up like a third world country such as Brazil or a disaster like Germany and Sweden right now? Okay, so Brazil's a second world country. Uh, technically, it's a developing country. It's not like a fully underdeveloped country uh, or a failed state. And why, um, is, why is there a far right candidate winning at the moment? I mean, if you want to argue Brazilian politics, I agree that Brazilian politics have been dominated by the, the far left, but I'm not sure that that's of tremendous interest. Let's talk about the first question. Okay, right. When I say I don't care about the browning of America, what I mean is I don't care about ethnicity. It doesn't make any difference to me. The only thing that makes a difference to me is the ideals of the people who are coming across the border. Now, when people say I am pro-illegal immigration, I do not know where in the hell they would possibly get that. This seems to, when people, repeat, when people repeatedly say stuff like this, like, and, and I see this meme all the time, oh, Shapiro cares about a Jewish ethnostate, but he, but he doesn't care about illegal immigration. I was further right than Donald Trump was in the last election cycle on illegal immigration. I opposed the 2006 amnesty deal. I opposed the 2010 amnesty deal. I have I've consistently been anti-illegal immigration. I supported the wall. This is just a lie. The idea that I'm pro-illegal immigration is not true in the slightest. What I have said is that we ought to deal with how to stop the influx of illegal immigration and then deal with the people who are here and separate off the two issues. And when it comes to the folks who are here illegally, what we should do is we should assess those folks in the same way we assess everybody else coming into the country. Are they going to add economically to the country and culturally to the country? Are they going to make the country a better place? Or are they going to make the country a worse place? And that involves assimilation. Now, as far as the idea of the Jewish ethnostate, I don't care very much about, at all actually, about Jewish ethnicity. Jewish ethnicity makes no difference to me. What does make a difference to me is Jewish ideals, because I care about Judeo-Christian ideals in the United States, and I care about Jewish ideals in Israel, which is why I don't care, and I'm very happy, that thousands, tens of thousands of Ethiopian Jews who are black 
were flown to Israel to become Israelis. I'm very happy that tens of thousands of Russian Jews who were Russian were flown from Russia to become Israelis. My wife is Moroccan, right? She's a Moroccan Israeli. So this idea that, that it's, a, it's, it's about ethnicity as opposed to ideology or ideas is just not true. The, the amazing thing about Judaism, just like most other religions, is you can become one. Okay, I can't become a black man. There's no way for me to do it, right? I can become a Christian. You could become a Jew, right? This means that there are ideological systems that you can buy into that allow you entry. And I believe that the United States should operate the same way. You can become an American if you buy into Central American ideals, but I'm not gonna pretend that I care whether a, whether a bunch of people who are pro-America and pro-American ideals come from Cuba versus coming from Britain. I, I understand that. I respect your beliefs and your white to hold them, Ben. Uh, I just think that uh, personally- I have a question for you. Why are you equating white or race with culture? Why are you saying these are the same thing? Well, because most, you know, you know Jew, Jews mostly practice Judaism and just like, uh, you know- well, Actually, and, most Jews actually don't practice Judaism, technically speaking, uh, but well, is it most well, ethnic Jews are lefties? Most of them are part of that. So it's only a, like a minority of people that want to convert to Judaism, which I don't mind. Okay, know, and it's only a minority of people converts. who want to become Americans, or, sh or we should let in if they want to become Americans enough. I'm asking not about Israel, but I'm asking you about America. Okay, I'm well, asking you about America. So you're saying that you object to the so-called browning of America. Well, Why? I, no, I, I'm just saying I, I object to illegal immigration, which, you so know. So do I, but your it's, original it's, question was about the browning of America, yeah, so that's, why? You know, basically, you know, it's basically like the open borders, uh, you know, I Germany agree with you about Sweden, illegal immigration. That's going on right now. I agree with you about illegal yeah. immigration. Yeah. I asked you about not about that. I'm asking you about the Browning of America phrase because okay. that's what you objected to. Okay. I said well, I don't care about the Browning. The whole of America. entire culture is changing at the moment. Just so you know. I understand that culture is changing at the moment, but I do not think that culture and race are inseparable. I don't think that brown people are less capable of becoming American, or black people are less All capable right. of becoming American, or Jews, uh, or anybody else. And I agree that, you know, when people come to this country, including, you know, myself and my family who immigrated here illegally in the, in the 80s, and I think that, you know, that people that do it, they follow the law and they assimilate, they should do that. Right. I mean, let's put it this way. Can we agree on this? I care about the liberalizing of America and the destruction of American values. I don't care about what the nature of the people who look like is who believe in American values. Those people are my family. Everybody who doesn't believe in those American ideals is not. All right. Thank you. <laughs> this will be the last question, ladies and gentlemen. This will be the last question. Hey, how's it going? Big Ben, what's up with you? How's it going, dude? <laughs> hey, I'm doing all right. <laughs> Okay, so my question is, well, first I'm gonna kinda... Um, I need to give you this hammer. You're enormous, dude. Like, <laughs> you can wield this much better than I can. I look like one of the, one of the dwarves from, seven, from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I'm like, go mining or something. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, uh, first I'm gonna kinda paraphrase another speaker who kinda operates along your same tone uh, in America, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Um, so, Uh, so one of the things that he often talks about is at the basis or the premise of the ongoing debate between conservatism versus uh, liberalism is that at the basis of each, uh, conservative, conservatism is uh, like the, um, the protection of the hierarchy, whereas on the liberal side it's more so the pr protection and promotion of egalitarianism. And so my question to you is, one thing that he makes clear is that both sides are necessary for or are ideal in a country that moves forward at a fast pace as the United States has, has done. And so my question to you is, it seems as though you have a more hostile, you have such a hostility towards liberals and, um, and leftists, whereas I, I don't often hear you at all say that there's anything that you can learn from their side. In his book, 12 Rules of Life, one of the chapters is assume that the person in which you're speaking with has something to offer you as far as intellectually that you may learn from them. So my question to you is, um, I guess, what 
is your position, like, do you feel as though a liberal, or obviously a liberal, but liberals in general or leftists in general have anything to bring to the table from an ideology standpoint or intellectually? I mean, passion for change is obviously, it can be a good thing when directed in the proper channel. Uh, the, as you say, the, the, the left's focus on egalitarianism is good so long as it is focused on the equal application of rights, not on the false attempts to override biology and natural hierarchy. So I think Jordan would agree with me uh, on the idea that if you run up, if you butt up against a natural hierarchy, uh, or if you butt up against natural differences, because I don't think every difference is a hierarchy. If you butt up against natural difference, you butt up against reality, trying to override reality with artificial equality is going to be a giant failure and can, as Jordan would say, murder millions in the, in the process, right? That's what Jordan thinks communism was. It was basically there are differences between human beings. Failure to respect those differences is what, le in the name of equality, is what leads to the gulags. Uh, so while Jordan is, uh, you know, Jordan, uh, I think he's, he's a little bit less uh, robust in the language that he uses with regard sure. to the left, he's, uh, he's just as anti-left with regard to the focus on hardcore egalitarianism. Where the left, so I, I, I do think, and I do make a distinction between, as I've said, liberals and liberals the left. left sure. uh, the, the, the left is a far more censorious force, and they want to censor a lot more, uh, they're a lot more tyrannical, they want to control a lot more from the top. People who are liberals who are arguing over the proper scope of government in particular areas, there I think there's plenty to learn, and I think that you can have fulsome exchanges about the nature of what sort of social welfare state can be supported uh, or is appropriate. And you can have a data exchange on that sort of thing. Um, where you can't really have an exchange is when you're running up against, is when people are falsifying the facts, as they are when they say that men and women are exactly the same, for example. So, um, so I appreciate the critique, and, I, and I'll try to take that to heart. Sure. Uh, and I think that, and I will acknowledge also that I think that folks had a lot more to learn from the left in the 1960s than they do now, because the sure. country has moved in, in a lot of very good ways since the 1960s and in some bad ways since the 1960s. Fair enough, thank you. And thanks a lot. <laughs> Can I ask another question or? Yeah, one more, go for it. We have another one? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this, more, this has to do with the whole, um, uh, uh, you know, national anthem in players kneeling during games in the yeah. NFL. And so my question is this, is I feel that Regardless of whether you agree with the act or not, someone taking a knee during the national anthem at the beginning of a football game, I believe that if you, if you don't say, okay, I disagree with the act, I don't think it's the right place, I don't think it's the right whatever the case may be, however, I agree with it in so much as I would like to protect that individual's freedom of speech. And my question is, I don't hear well, you certainly, or a lot of any, anyone on the conservative side or uh, right side, as you would call it, um, as someone may call it, defending, saying, okay, look, I don't agree with it, but I agree with that person's freedom of speech in that moment, or you, so, utilizing so that it, So it depends on the forum. So this is a public university. I have a right to speak here, right? There's a sure. difference between that and, for example, DePaul University. So mm -hmm. DePaul University is a private university. Last year, I think it was last year, uh, DePaul invited me to speak, or at least some of the students did. The administration said I couldn't, and when I showed up on campus, they threatened to arrest me. I didn't sue the university, because they have a right to do that. I think they're wrong, I think they're foolish, but they have a right to do that. Okay. So Colin Kaepernick does not have the right to kneel on the sidelines of a private NFL event. If he wants to kneel in a park, now, he's more you, than welcome to do according so. According to who he doesn't have the right? Uh, well, he doesn't, he doesn't have the legal right. He can't sue the NFL to force them oh, to... Oh, so he can't sue the NFL, certainly. So, so, so that, that's the distinction that I'm making. When it come, like, if, if Colin Kaepernick were to come here, like right here, you know, and like after the event that we haven't organized, he wants to kneel on the stage all day long, that's totally fine. It's a public university, he can do what he wants. So, I, so time, place, and manner restrictions are a thing, and so is private versus public. So I'll defend Colin that... Kaepernick's right to say whatever the hell he wants in any public area so long as he's not violating the rights of private property owners to control their property, because they do have rights that, like, he couldn't come into my living room and just kneel on the floor. Sir, do, you think the, do you think the conversation is based around the fact that the NFL is a private organization, or is it based, upon, based around the fact that they feel that that action disrespects our military in that moment because the national anthem is so associated well, I think the with... NFL, I think the NFL handled this in the worst way possible, which is they okay. allowed certain messages and not other messages. Then right? we're on so, the same page. Right, so like a few years ago, there were a bunch of guys in Missouri who did the hands up, don't shoot symbol coming out of the St. Louis Rams. They came out of the tunnel doing the hands up, don't shoot. They weren't fine, nothing happened. If the NFL wants to set a standard that you're not allowed to make political statements during the games or in the warm-ups or something, totally cool. But if they're gonna be inconsistent in the, in the application of those standards, then I've got a bit of a problem with them. And I think that Roger Goodell has done a terrible job with that. It's, and you know how you know this? Because David Stern actually banned people from sitting for the national anthem in 1996 with Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf, and nothing happened. He set the standard, that was the end of it. 
If you want to go protest, don't protest here. Go protest somewhere else, and nobody cared. The, but that, that's really not even the lar look. The larger issue about Kaepernick is, you know, whether it is appropriate generally for people to kneel for the national anthem, or whether we should be insulted by that. You know, my feeling is that it's generally not appropriate. But you have a, having a right to do something does not make it the appropriate or right thing to do. I don't think that kneeling for the national anthem is either smart politics or the right thing to do, because there are certain things that still have to unify us, like the idea the country is based on good foundations. And if he wanted to kneel for the national anthem outside a police station, I think that would be a lot more useful for his, for his supposed cause than you know, taking millions and millions of dollars of contracts from Nike to pretend to be a social justice warrior. I'm very skeptical of Colin Kaepernick. I, I think there are a lot of people who actually care about these issues and have studied the issues and don't wear socks with pictures of cops as pigs on them. Yeah, I would, yeah, for, uh, just want to say thank you. And I, uh, I agree that if that was going to happen, Colin Kaepernick may not have been the best proponent, the best individual to make that stand in that situation. Thanks well, a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, how's it going? Good evening, Mr. Shapiro. My name is Chanel Powell. Nice to meet you. You too. So I'm a liberal in view. Those are my views, and while we Well, again, have, thank you for coming. I appreciate when people who well, disagree Well, I appreciate come. you coming to our campus and speaking with us. So I came here essentially out of support for YAF, and I also came here to listen and learn from you from what you're saying. I think it's important to see opposite sides and discuss, right? But my question to you is, how do we essentially bridge the gap from two different points of view? How are we able to meet in the middle? By listening, I mean, essentially, we want the same thing. We want better for our country and better for our people. Everyone in this room is our people. How do we take care of them? How do we meet in the middle and take care of them? Well, I mean, I think that we actually have to determine, to be completely frank, whether we do want the same thing. Because I think that sometimes people on left and right think they want the same thing in vague terms, like better country. But we actually have to determine what better country looks like. So do we want a country where there's more freedom to rise and fall economically, or do we want a country with more enforced rigidity of income, for example? Uh, that's an actual difference in goal. Uh, do we want a country where men and women are free to pursue whatever lives that they want, uh, encouraged to pursue, pursue, pursue virtue at the same time, or do we see that encouragement by social groups to virtue as a sort of block and check on, on freedom? You know, there, there, are certain, there are certain areas where we have to clarify exactly what we think an ideal America looks like. My ideal America is basically John Stuart Mill's America. You get to do whatever you want. You wave your hand around as much as you want until you hit somebody in the face. But that is also contingent on all of us trying to act virtuously toward our neighbors. So I think that the great genius of the founders is that they were balancing uh, the, the sort of European Enlightenment view of liberty with the more traditionalist view of what private citizenry looked like, which was a duty-based private citizenry of duty to your neighbor, not based on what government tells you to do. I'm not sure that that's what the ideal America looks like necessarily for a lot of folks on the left who feel perhaps, that individual rights need to take a back seat to collective solutions, right? So, for example, my ideal America is not an America where the government forces doctors to provide care at a certain price. Because I think that a free market, a free market solution is not just better for healthcare, I think it's more moral. I think that a consent-based society is a more moral society in economics. A lot of folks on the left say, well, consent-based society won't get us to universal healthcare. Right, so they, they, these, are, these are serious conversations and serious discussions. I think the way that we can have a conversation is actually by sitting and defining terms. So very few conversations begin with the defining of the terms. They sort of start with second order conversations. So instead of saying, what do you want healthcare to look like in America? What are your competing rights and values? Instead, we start with, we all want the same thing and therefore nationalized healthcare. Or we all want the same thing and therefore complete privatization. We might not actually want the same thing. So we might want to start with that discussion first. What do you want to see? So what I would like to see in, in some of these areas is more individual freedom and then social, social networks outside of government picked up the slack. That's what my ideal America looks like. For a lot of folks on the left, they don't trust the social networks. They think that the government has to come in and, and take care from the top down. These are, these are fundamentally different views of the country. And I'm not sure that they are completely bridgeable. We can have conversations about them, but in the end, I think that clarity is sometimes preferable to, to agreement in ambiguity. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thanks so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.